No thoughts, head empty. Not a single thought in my head. Wow. But okay, I guess without further ado, we are playing Selene Apoptosis. I don't really know that word at all. It's a visual novel that has nudity and horror elements. That's all I know. I have no clue how it found its way in my Steam library. But it's there. Okay, let's go ahead and start. Let's see what happens. The sound was driving him crazy. Oh boy. When on and his muffled thoughts were resonating throughout his head with dull pain. The pain wasn't too strong. Nothing unbearable. But that sound. More than anything else, he wanted the sound to just stop. Thud. Nevertheless, the knocking sounds didn't end. That's nice. He knew it well enough because he himself was their origin. Interesting. Thud. 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 The nose of his slipper was hitting the rear of his desk over and over again, like a huge fluffy moth frantically ramming against the window glass. That's... Interesting, to put it lightly. He wanted, actually, he wanted plenty of things. He wanted to pay the rent in time this month, not to displace his landlady again. He wanted to finish the script, at least in draft, because a draft is way better than nothing, something one can work with. And he wanted to sleep. No, not quite that. Their problem, a serious one, was that he didn't really want to sleep. He leaned back in his chair and rubbed his shut eyes, pressing his eyeballs until dancing pale lights appeared. Of course, he took the sleeping pills, and a healthy eight-hour sleep gives way to a not-so-healthy five-hour nap, then a three-hour eyes shut break, and then goes away entirely. You stop thinking how this will impact your liver. I mean, you just want to sleep. You need to sleep, especially if you already taken an advance payment for the first part of a gig, and the goddamn text won't just write itself. However, if the text could in fact write itself somehow, he'd probably lose his job. He didn't have any illusions in this regard. As soon as neural networks get smart enough, he and dozens of other ghostwriters will vanish into a morning mist of a new era in literature. He didn't have much of a name or connections, only some skill and a knack to meet the deadlines for the most part. The client was content with this, and he was content with the pay, so everything went well until the pills started failing him. Blam. This time the tick got too strong. His foot jerked and hit the board with very noticeable pain. It seemed like he even heard his toes crack. He muttered a shirt short curse and rolled the chair away from the desk, although he knew. Now that his attention was not fixed on the blank text file, the tick should go away all by itself. It's funny how the consciousness is detached from the body. He often thought about it, especially while having insomnia. It's like you're working as a team, but your partner starts pooling something. You seem to have common goals, but when all hell breaks loose, you're suddenly left alone with it and your partner is more interested in watching the fire than fighting it. In the end, you have no idea what's on his mind. Well, at least there won't be any more knocking. Good. A small window at the far side of the room flashed white for a moment. A storm. Now that he thought about it, the day was hot. The vicious, stagnant air filled, still filled the room. This, and the barely audible squeak of an overhead overheated network filter. Words. He became sensitive to such things when he couldn't sleep for a long time, made the entire room seem to vibrate a little. Like a cocoon that's about to hatch. That's nice. Actually, that didn't sound like a good line. Or did it? I... <laughs> we may never know if I read that line correctly. <laughs> He rolled back to the table and was able to write that thought down, but paused over the keyboard. 
He remembered the individual words and the general idea, but the sentence had already slipped away. This time, the white light seemed to fill the entire room. Then, a thunder followed, resembling a low gut roar of something large and famished. Good lord. He called to God way too often for someone who never goes to church. Just a habit he inherited from his mother. A furious patter of raindrops pounded on his window. There's no way he could work like this. Not now. But maybe it's for the best. Since he was a little boy, he slept well during the storms. He had to seize the moment. He groped for a packer of sleeping pills. Okay, that's a sentence. It's nice to have your working tools at hand. Popped the pills into his mouth and opened the window to hear the steady patter of this rain. Then he went to bed and collapsed on top of the bed sheets, his clothes still on. He could tell by the sound the water had flooded the window. He could tell by the sound the water had flooded the windowsill and was trickling down to the floor. He decided that was a small price to pay. He felt a pleasant chill of cloth beneath his cheek. The wavering haze was gradually fading from the room. Yet the sleep did not come. He tried to take off his shoes, change the position, take a pillow, cover himself threw the pillow away to the other side of the room. Nothing helped. He just lay there with his eyes closed, and though his cl and though his closed lids felt heavy, he knew it was an illusion. I need to stop questioning words and just keep reading the sentence and see what happens, man. All in vain. He's not sleeping. He can't sleep. Oh boy, red. Thud. At first he thought he was imagining things. Thud. 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 Sometimes the knocking passed, but it never stopped completely. The sound came from below, from the first floor. Someone was banging insistently on the door. And with each thud, he could feel the rage building up like a tight knot of pain around his stomach. He was... trying... to sleep. Is it really that hard to just leave a man alone? Yes. At least at night, at least in the house that he pays for, specifically so that nobody would bother him. He opened his eyes, easy just as he thought, sprang to his feet and ran down the stairs. Something was boiling inside him. That doesn't sound healthy. Halfway to the door, he took a turn to the cupboard, pulled out an old baseball bat. He wasn't likely to actually use it. He asked himself if he would, as he reached for the door handle. No, he certainly wouldn't. But he's angry, and he wants the night guest to le learn it. Ugh. What the hell? The rain was still pouring. The mother was actually getting stronger. As his mother would say, when the floodgates of heaven tore open. His mother used to say a lot of things, as mothers tend to do. I was on the list of reasons why he had to rent this overpriced house where anyone could start banging on the door in the middle of the night. A cat, for example. A meow meow? What the hell? That's not a cat. I mean, cat girl. Yeah. He has the cat ears and the cat tail, but that... That's a cat girl, not, not just a cat man. And he said it again, this time aloud. A cat was standing on his porch. Okay, we're just insisting that this cat girl is a cat. Okay. She looked like a purebred British short hair in all respects, except for the color. And the flesh, and the being a person. Aside from the smoky gray head, it seemed as if she were dropped into a vat of white paint, while her lower part was dipped into a black one. Okay. Weird description. <laughs> Man, assuming that's a cat. Yeah. I don't know. Wet fur clung to her small, rather skinny body, dripping with water. Fur, huh? Okay, I'm gonna stop asking questions. The cat could have probably slipped into the house as soon as the door opened, but instead she froze, as if waiting for the host to say something. 
let her in or should we refuse? I feel like nothing but bad things will happen if we refuse. Well, actually, no, I have a bad feelings about both <laughs> options. I have really bad feelings about both options. <laughs> uh, what do you guys think? Let her in or refuse? Nothing good will happen in either option. But we do have to pick one. Unfortunately. Part of me wants to pick Refuse because that might end to like a bad ending or something real quick fast. But I also don't want to get jump scared. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> Me too, I want to be edgy. Okay, fuck it, sure. I'll put on my brave pants. It'll be raining again soon. Huh? Okay, I guess we can't refuse. Well... Okay, I'm glad I was wrong about it being a jump- I mean, that was a little bit of a jump scare, but like, you know. I'm not gonna push. Let's just let her in, right? Yeah. It was cold outside. Much colder than one might think. He didn't feel angry anymore. He. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, come in. He stepped aside, freeing the doorway. The cat didn't move. So, you don't want to, huh? He was about to say fine then, close the door, go back to the second floor, and lie in a suffocating half-sleep until morning. But he finally realized what was wrong. <laughs> he who? He as in him? I am assuming so. <laughs> the bat? Oh, yeah, he has a baseball bat. That's not very welcoming to a little meow meow. He threw it away, aiming for the sofa, but missed. The bat clattered on the floorboards. That's nice. The cat followed it into the darkness with her round yellow eyes. The sounds didn't frighten her. He sighed. I won't hurt you. Come in if you want. And the cat raised her eyes at him. For the first time, he actually saw and couldn't help admiring how big and yellow they were. The cat's pupils were also large and incredibly round, like two full moons in an eclipse. Just as he was about to close the door for the second time, the cat murmured something and fluttered into the house, butting him with her wet head as he as she passed by. So is she like actually a cat proper, but we're for whatever reason seeing a cat girl? What's going on, man? He smiled. Strictly speaking, at this very moment, his line had ended. If the landlady found out, and he was sure she would, he'd have to look for a new place to live. There are plenty of lonely, bored seniors in the neighborhood, he thought. And they all have two hobbies, observing and reporting. The subject and the recipient aren't that important. Well, it's fine. Maybe he'd leave the suburbs. The rain was getting stronger still. He closed the door. And the cat explored the house with cautious curiosity, stopping by different objects, as if trying to understand their purpose. Watching that was amusing. So amusing he even forgot about the stain. What stain? When he remembered, and already spread out, a dark spot of water in the place where the cat clung to him. He pulled the wet cloth away from his body and stared at it blankly for a moment, and almost groaned aloud. The cat was soaked, so she probably got a lot of dirt in the house. He decided not to turn on the light, he had enough disappointment for the night. Instead, he went to get a towel. Alright, come here. The cat turned her head to the voice in frozen place. She was examining the TV a lifeless black mirror of plasma panel in a black curve frame that he hadn't even touched since moving in. In the reflection, the cat looked... The... That, 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 that. Let's try that again. In the reflection, the cat herself looked black. 
She gave him a long, appraising look, and then, with a sudden eagerness, trotted towards him, deftly avoiding the obstacles. He was surprised. Maybe the cat decided he was more interesting than the TV. Maybe she acted out of respect for her host's will. Anyway, he felt grateful. Finally, someone he can actually negotiate with. A cat. Hmm. Suddenly he thought how nice it would be to call under the blanket with a warm ball of fur. <laughs> Which really have helped him to fall asleep. As a child, he had a cat. Gray, huge, brash, br bleh, brash, immensely ugly, and equally beloved. He often fell asleep hugging him. The cat's name was Timo, and he faded into a June night many years ago. And the cat bumped her wet head against him once more. He thought that cats usually shake off the water themselves. Usually, but perhaps not always. Hey, easy there. You're all wet. Mm-hmm. And the cat looked up at him with her moon-shaped eyes and murmured something again. Do something about it, then. He smiled and got to work. He had to squeeze the fur thoroughly, so the towel soon turned into a wet rag. Should he? Bathe the cat, or it doesn't matter. Honestly, the spacing in bathe is a little weird, so I, at first glance, thought this is like, bah, the cat, but that makes no sense. Um, hmm. I feel like we might get scolded again if we click doesn't matter. Uh, let's see. Never mind, this can wait. Oh, never mind. I was wrong. I was wrong! Oh well. The cat's fur wasn't very long, but it was fluffy enough to hide her sunken sides. He was once again surprised how skinny she was. Oh, her dress color changed. He was even more surprised when he noticed a collar with a small locket. So you do have a home. In this case, you also have some shitty orna- sh <laughs> Shitty owners, I must say. Nekar curled up on a wet towel in his lap, slowly dozing off, as cats should do. He could feel that familiar lulling vibe emerging inside her. Suddenly he put the towel with the cat on it away. I should get you some food. Let me see what I have. He got up, with just a tad bit difficulty, nothing he couldn't handle. Still, his body felt unusually heavy and unwieldy. He had to give the cat something to eat. He will lie down afterwards, and then, hell, maybe he'll even fall asleep. Maybe he should have gotten a cat for out much earlier, a ball of fur with a pair of moon eyes and relative voice that you can always negotiate with. And that's about it. That's kind of funny. He could have avoided all that suffering if only he had a cat. The kitchen blurred before his eyes. He got to the refrigerator and opened it, squinting from the light and leaning on the door way harder than he was supposed to. If the landlady was around at the time, she would have told him exactly so, don't lean on the door. After all, this is her house and her refrigerator, and everything should be neat and tidy in case she has to move new tenants in. Perhaps the landlady would have even warned him about the milk. The milk itself is completely harmless, unless, of course, you're allergic to lactose, but there's a special kind of lactose-free milk, right? What matters is the bottle. Bottles, much like cats, can vary greatly, but this particular one was made of glass. If only the landlady was here, she would probably have told him not to touch the bottle, because it's falling on the floor, and the bottle might break, and then the milk will spill, and he'll have nothing to feed the nice cat he found. Rather, it was her who found him, and very timely, because he was lying on the floor. He had been lying there for some time, and would have been lying still if he hadn't felt the light touch of something hot and rough on his cheek. Lick? It was like, it was almost like a dream, although of course, comparing sleep with fainting isn't quite correct, no matter how you look at it. The floor beneath him was surprisingly hard, cold, and wet. 
They've got all those three qualities clearly, and uh, blah 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 blah. And was afraid to imagine what would happen if he tried to move. But he had to move one way or another. I like to see what's up, because something hot and rough was still sliding up his cheek, gradually creeping up to his ear. He felt a warm breath, and then a cautious bite. <laughs> Ouch. He jumped on the spot. The shadow rushed to the side, and then calmly began to lap milk from a puddle. <laughs> yeah, a very quick CG. <laughs> Well, some cat, huh? Am I going so slow? I don't know, man. Atmosphere. The cat. <laughs> what are you doing? The cat looked at him briefly and licked her lips. Oh, wait, she has a voice? How long has that been voiced? <laughs> Amazing. It was in English too, so I guess I don't have to read her lines. Interesting, interesting. You were lying around idly. You're not even a cat, see? Who knows, man? What if I am a cat, huh? Can you prove that I'm not a cat? Hmm? Besides, you're soaked in milk. Maybe. Well, you're right. I let you down and had to get my punishment. Huh? I let myself down too. Good lord, now there's cleaning to do until... the next advent, like his mother would have said. I'll go get a rag. Stay here and don't ruin what's left of the kitchen while I'm gone. The guy watched him go with a skeptical look. Aren't you the one who's been causing all the trouble so far? Listen, I don't need to be backsassed by some cats. When he returned with the bucket, the cat was gone. Oh dear. The theater of presents. Okay. How to bake. S redacted. Okay. In the kitchen, something exciting is happening. Oh, hello. Sock puppet. Sock puppet. Okay. Take. Redacted. You'll need a blade. That's nice. Another sock puppet. Did you take the pills? Scratch out the entra entrails. The Egyptians widely used honey for embalming and preserving food. Later, their recipes were adopted by the Greeks. Also, add a teaspoon of apricot jam, walnut, and a little cinnamon. Cinnamon. Why was that a struggle? Yo, the guy definitely has issues. What was the first time calling a cat girl a cat? Or... <laughs> oh boy. Before baking, put a teaspoon of butter on top of redacted. Uh-huh. Microwave for five to seven minutes at full power. Mm-hmm. Don't listen to them scream. That's nice. Though if you manage to put a head in a microwave, I'm not sure it can really scream. Unless you, like, freshly chopped it off. I'm gonna stop commenting on that. Bon appetit! Oh my. Well, this is exciting. The next time he saw her was in a few days. Well, maybe in a week. He always had a bad sense of time, especially when he was immersed in his work. He still couldn't sleep, but at least he was making some progress with the script. It was a narrative game project, as the customer called it, but actually meant, do whatever you have to finish it on time, else forget about the payment. That's nice. 
And so he did. Although he was resentful, and that got in the way a lot. The reason of those feelings was the cat. Mm-hmm. He knew how stupid that was, but he couldn't help it. He forgave her for the bite almost immediately. That wasn't the thing. He was bitter about how the cat ran away, despite him trying his best to take care of her. She was nowhere to be found in the house, so he immediately thought about an open window on the second floor. Maybe he should have closed it. He dwelled on the thought for a while. He even approached the window at some point, when in the end he decided not to do anything about it. He was hoping, and there was no shame in that. It's not the same as you'd turn up ten and start eyeing girls. The cat would come back. And she did. He had just settled himself on a sofa with some book. Some was the word, as he couldn't remember a thing from the the cover. From the the cover. Yeah, I love that one. Even though he read the title several times. The symbols were floating before his eyes, and of course he couldn't make out a word. No wonder, considering he didn't sleep at all. When you think about it, it was surprising he could write in this state. Either way, he was barely following the book, so he wasn't upset at all when a fluffy head butted his hand. Hey, I'm trying to read here. Nope. Hi. You don't seem to be getting anywhere. Listen, let me take my time trying to read, man. It's a struggle sometimes. What does it matter anyways? That's a good question. Um, why doesn't anything matter though, Miss Cat? Better scratch me right here. Um the cat achievement. So you're a cat patter, huh? <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> he complied. You are absent for so long. I thought you won't be back. I think that's supposed to be wouldn't be back. Then why didn't you close the window upstairs? Um. There's a big difference between expectations and hopes. He had learned that well. Why'd you leave? Did I do anything wrong? And the cat stayed silent. Bitterness. Happiness. Uh, hmm. Given what happened last time with the choice, I want to actually think this one through. Um, bitterness or happiness? I'll go with happiness because that feels like the more safe option. I'm not looking to be in danger from a cat, you know? Alright, it doesn't matter that much. I'm happy to have you back. After all, there's no point in his grudge from the start. Nobody gains anything by holding on to small grudges and staying blind to what they really feel. You wouldn't have won anything. It's not a damn lottery. The cat rubbed against his arm again. He put the book down and gently placed her on his lap. A locket around her neck, unexpectedly cold, touched his skin. Then he got a hunch. Did you go home? I have no home. Oh. Um, okay. Well, someone must be caring about you if they put that collar on. Sometimes a collar is just a collar. Not on a cat, but, you know, I digress. Don't you know? No. This time it was him who stayed silent. The cat buried her head in his stomach. Want me to take it off? No. Okay. It is mine now. Fair. Besides, it's easier this way if I catch someone's eye on the streets. He nodded, because if you think about it, there really was a reasonable choice. The cat's fur was thick and smooth, very pleasant to the touch. He wanted to bury his face in it, find out what it smelled like. What she smells like. Do you have a name? Of course. Everything has a name. And what's yours? And the cat looked at him carefully with her bright yellow eyes as if saying, take a guess. But she didn't actually say anything. On her locker there was a small engraving. A crescent root. Blah, blah. A crescent moon that was dimly shining in the pale light coming out of the window. 
Selim. The cat looked up at him, and her pupils flickered into two full moons in her eclipse. Then she rubbed against his arm one last time, and stood up, stretching, arching her back. Don't close the window on the second floor. Okay. They won't. She left, but the name stayed with him, in and around the house. Selene. So hummed the class, white in the moonlight. So whispered the long shadows of the branches outside the window. Uh, focus on the name, or doesn't matter. Um... Hmm, how crazy do we feel like being? Uh, you know what, fuck it, let's focus on all the name and get full crazy. What is Celine? For some reason, the question bothered him. He vaguely remembered. It had something to do with the mythology. Such things never really caught his interest, but fortunately he knew someone he could turn to. Okay. No. Oh. Discover an alternate POV. Okay. Hope. I see. Ethan. You know I can't stand them. You know it's me who'll have to take care of it after all. You're basically living in the office. Ethan never liked cats. Okay. And the dogs too. Not much of a difference. There is enough of a difference, but I digress. He didn't like the very idea of keeping a predator at home, even a small one. He couldn't explain why. You're lost, man. Hope sighed. She closed the tab with the Cattery's website, then slapped her husband lightly on the shoulder. Even so, the faces of Persian cats, deeply depressed and equally concave, still lingered before his mind's eye. He then held up his hands in a conciliatory gesture. Uh, what the, uh, what the, what the, why is that word there? What does it mean? Why are there big ass words in this? He knew it wasn't over yet. Hope was not the one to give in this easy. She never was. Yet for him, there was something incredibly appealing about it. Come to think of it, quite possible it'll be him who capitulates in the end. Oh, what are these words? <laughs> in a relationship, you always have to sacrifice something. In four and a half years, or even five according to Hope, he had learned this quite well. Suddenly, Hope frowned, looking at the screen. Seems like you got an email from, um, Sam. A tough one. Mm, I can't quite read it. That's nice. It just hit your work mailbox. Work email mail. Let me see. I hope I got a new project. <laughs> hope. The Middle Ages are fine and all, but they're all. But they are about to start pouring out of my ears. That's. Hmm. Ethan reached for his laptop, but Hope grabbed it and dodged him. Talk contracts on a Sunday evening. Hmm. Because Sundays are weekends. So, which one of us is all work and no play? Hmm. Well, such are the benefits of freelance. Come on, give it back. Hope giggled and leaned over the armrest, hanging over the floor. Hope's defenses withstood several more attacks. Each time Ethan thought the laptop would definitely hit the floor. Then she gave Ethan a peck on the cheek and slid off the couch. The laptop returned to its owner. All right, all right. I give up. Oh, you're not going to read this one yourself, Hope? I see how it is. I mean, what if they actually give you a new contract? But on the same old Middle Ages? Now that would be a twist. That would be a twist. Yeah, a hilarious one. 
But there's nothing about the Middle Ages in the letter, not a mention of the payment, too. Ethan read it several times. Leaving the formalities aside, there was but one question in the letter. Ethan, or rather, the part of him that was responsible for finding the accurate answers, got immediately engaged by the wording. Oh. What is Celine? Ah, I see. Ethan rolled that question around in his mouth, as if tasting it. Hmm. At a glance, the answer was simple. <laughs> you like how she seems nice? I don't trust anything or any- Yeah, I don't trust anything or anyone in this game. <laughs> At a glance, the answer was simple. Ethan's real passion was the early renaissance, but he was a history consultant after all. At least he liked to think of himself that way. The agency was paying him for a reason. He needed no research to tell that Selene was the goddess of the moon of the ancient Greece. In the ancient Greece. Okay. The question, however, seemed to be way more intricate in its nature. Or at least that's what Ethan wanted to think. Because the Middle Ages were actually about to start pouring out of his ears. He was always diving into his work completely, and living in an age where madness, curse, and death are contagious in an exhausting trial. He needed some distraction. Of course, he had a part-time job with his online courses, but the platform where he lectured wasn't planning anything new just yet. All in all, the request looked interesting, if not for one small matter. The payment. Or rather, the lack thereof. Ethan hesitated. The sender's name seemed familiar. He searched the email address and found out that they already worked together on a couple of texts. Both times, his efforts were duly paid for by the agency. Ethan never worked for free. It wasn't- It was- Was- Mm-hmm. It was his principle, but rather a matter of necessity. Their problem here was the fact that Ethan loved what he was doing too much. And if you're trying to make money from what you love, that's a slippery slope. A free service there, an unpaid consultation here, and then you go back to his splitting the sheep protector say eight hours a day, watching your dreams rust away. Besides, Ethan didn't want to let Hope down. Of course she supported him when he decided to go freelance, but Ethan never wanted to take advantage of that. No, that won't do. He works only under contract and does not give free consultations. Just as he was about to give that as a response, Hope's fair head popped out from behind the door. Are you coming? Um. On the walk, Hope brought up the cat thing a few more times. Ethan protested absently. His thoughts went back to the letter again and again, to that question. The more he thought about it, the more he wanted to find the answer. It was no longer a matter of helping an acquaintance whose name Ethan immediately forgot. No. It was Ethan himself who needed a little help with the distraction, and an answer. That was a weird thing to do, but Ethan waited until Hope was fast asleep. Only then did he sneak over to his laptop to write a response. Certainly, he had no real answer as of yet. He threw in a few dozen polite words, the general meaning of which was, he had taken up the case. Then he clicked send. When Ethan returned to bed, Hope was still breathing slow and deep. He listened to her breath for a while, trying not to think that he had broken his own rule. After all, he really needed a distraction. No matter the strength of your affection, Sooner or later, you will want to take a break. It was another thing that he had learned over the past four and a half years. If Ethan had to point out when things started to be off, he would say it was on Saturday. That is, about a week after the first letter. But this, of course, wouldn't be accurate. Those weird things started happening almost immediately after he pressed the send button. The first night he saw a room in his dreams. That's nice. 
and chipped white ceiling and similarly rough walls lit with fluorescent lamp fl 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 bleh, with fluorescent lamps. Ethan couldn't see the lamps themselves, but he recognized the cold, shimmering light. They often used those lamps in the offices. The light filled the room to the brim. Ethan thought it was about to burst, and then the light would splash all over the room just like the juice from a squished tomato. <laughs> the fucking fisheye lens on the fucking couch. Ugh. Apart from the walls and the light, the room had a red sofa. The sofa stood just a bit aside from the center. Not too large, quite faded, blood with shimmering white light. This light made the sofa seem to be trembling a little, and the room trembled with it. Suddenly, Nathan thought it would be way better if the sofa was standing right in the middle. Then he felt something on his temple. A touch. He had to flinch, scream, stumble to the side. Yet he couldn't. He was paralyzed. Only his eyes could move, and they desperately tried to reach beyond his field of vision, where something was touching his temple. He then felt a faint flow of air as if someone was whispering in his ear. He did hear the whisper, just one word. Ethan no longer remembered what the word was when he jumped up in his bed, gasping for air. Hope muttered something in her sleep and turned to the other side. It took a long time to get back to sleep, but by a morning, Ethan did pass out, and when he woke up, the dream wiped out of his mind pretty quick. The task at hand interested him much more than some buck spilling out of his subconscious. He was thinking about the task while he was chewing on the morning toast, driving to the bank and all the way back. It was just like a Christmas present waiting for its time in the closet. The more you tell yourself you shouldn't think about it, the more you do. At home, Ethan tried to stick to his plan, working on the project he was paid for, but ended up sitting over a single report for several hours and couldn't squeeze out a letter. To hell with it. After all, he was almost done with his current project. It wouldn't be much of a problem if he presented the result a bit later on, would it? Besides, it was really time for him to get a breather. One can't be spending so much time in a world where madness, curse, and death are contagious. To hell with it. Ethan thought as he closed the files of the project he was paid for. There was plenty of information, but Ethan knew he would not get an answer right away. The accurate answers, just like the precious pearls, lay at great depths. He had to go down to the very bottom. Ethan was not afraid. He had done it many times. His counterpart might have to wait for a week or so, but Ethan knew he'll manage to crack the riddle. Hmm. I liked that. That was nice. What he didn't know is what else could be found at those great depths. And at some point in this investigation, things started happening. He started hearing sparse phrases, even though he never turned on TV or radio, and Hope wasn't even at home. When he sat in front of the screen, once again trying to connect the dots in his research, he could feel someone looking at the back of his head. When he turned around, of course, there was no one in the room. Eventually he taught himself not to turn around, he just got angry, pushing fingers into his temples when the familiar feeling appeared again. He started losing things, or rather, things would disappear and then re then appear in the strangest of places. One day, he found his pencil in the freezer, stuck in a minced meat briquet. Briquet? What the fuck? Even when the- <laughs> not that word again. Melted down, he couldn't pull the whole pencil out. All he thing got was the bloody stump. That's nice. At this point, he could stop and think of it, but got distracted by the coffee maker and mindlessly shoved the stump into the trash bin. And there was something wrong with the shadows, too. 
that became sharper, thicker, and deeper, and it was the case in the whole apartment. Sometimes they moved. Of course, Ethan only felt like they were moving. It couldn't have been any other way. Ethan didn't really pay attention to any of this, just like he did with the dream he had. All of that seemed very familiar, as he already experienced similar things during the periods of intense work, when his nervous system was exhausted by the workload. There was always a rational explanation, the stress, or those new, much more environmentally friendly light bulbs that Hope had installed all around the apartment. Besides, it's so easy to dismiss this sort of things when you're deeply invested into something. And this question got really got Ethan involved. I can read. Every time he seemed to get it right, his thought went off. Like he was climbing a rock, but a safe ledge suddenly turned slippery, and the next thing he knew, he was at the bottom again. He never faced anything like that during his previous research. There were times he had to spend weeks or months looking for the right answers. Those were the tricky cases, but at least he could always tell how his research is progressing. This time, he was stumbling in his tracks, without knowing why, and that was all he could tell. The week was over, but he still had nothing to send back to his contact. In his reply, Ethan asked a couple of questions, not that he was really interested, just as a courtesy. And that's how the surprisingly exciting email conversation started. With this, Ethan's contact grew to be something more. Something of a friend, maybe. He never asked how's Ethan's work He never asked how Ethan's work was progressing. It was the question Ethan asked himself, and the answer was never good for him. Of course, he started sleeping badly. Falling asleep was easy, but he woke up many times during the night, sometimes in cold sweat. Ethan could not remember his dreams. That night, he woke up about three or four times. At first, Ethan was lucky enough to fall asleep almost immediately after he woke up. But at some point, his eyes got open again. This time, the sleep wouldn't come. Ethan felt terribly thirsty. He found no slippers on the usual spot. The noise could wake up Hope, so he decided not to look for them, and only regretted it when approaching the kitchen. The floor was bloody cold. So cold that Ethan unconsciously looked down. What's happening? And when he was looking up again, he saw a shadow. No doubt that shadow belonged to a woman. A naked woman. Ethan could clearly see the points of her nipples as the shadow turned around. No wonder. It's freezing cold here. The shadow moved slowly along the wall, letting a rectangular pool filled with moonlight. She was dancing. She was dancing, and the humming silence in Ethan's ears was her music. Ethan was watching her, unable to move. He was paralyzed, just like back then in his dream. But he did not remember it. At that moment, he didn't remember anything at all. Couldn't think about anything at all. What is this? He felt an itch in his eyes and a momentary urge to blink. Hi Spooky, welcome on in. How's it going? For a fraction of a second, he could only see the thick, viscous darkness. And when he opened his eyes again, there was no shadow anymore. Tired, that checks out. The glowing rectangle shifted its place and now lay on the kitchen floor at Ethan's feet. He could see the cold white light flowing into the seams between the tiles on the floor. 
For some reason, he took a deep breath and then stepped forward into the rectangle of light. Nothing happened. And what was supposed to happen? What did he really see? Did he really see anything? He walked deeper into the room, much bolder, grabbed the decanter and started drinking big greedy sips. Water streamed down his chin and chest, hitting the tiles on the floor and poured into the grooves of the seams. No, that wasn't a delusion. The kitchen was completely empty and the floor felt warm again, and yet it wasn't a delusion. And all of this was begging for a rational explanation. That's why Ethan decided he should talk to Hope in the morning. Something changed. Wait. TV program. Devil is made of clay and tomato soup just like any human being, huh? What does that mean? Interview with the devil. It's getting late and then I come. She serves tomato soup. She used to serve other things, but not anymore. I'm in the tomato soup. They both eat tomato soup. That's how I get in. Huh? What is this? <laughs> um... The Midnight TV made in its talk show interview with the devil. Two sixty nine, very nice. Um. Okay, then what's here? September fifteenth. The bus driver saw me redacted. He didn't laugh at me and didn't get mad like mom. He even allowed me to play in the bus. I wish there were more people like him. October eighth. I got an F for the essay. Mom will be mad. The bus driver said it was good, and I should keep writing. It's nice, but I'd rather have a B anyway. Her mom isn't too redacted. Alright, then. That's... That was interesting. Um... Did you give anyone the apartment keys? You know, uh, by chance. What? Hope froze with a cup at her lips and winked several times. Maybe you've let someone in? I... I didn't. No! What's with those questions? I feel like someone is visiting our place. What do you mean? Exactly what I said. <laughs> it's been a while since I started noticing random things vanish, and yesterday I... Hope frowned. She looked at Ethan as if... A toad had just popped out of his mouth. Amazing. Yesterday, you... What? Say it bluntly or answer evasively. Um... Frog. Yes. Um... Mm, options. Let's be blunt. I saw someone in her kitchen last night. Some girl. The deep line on Hope's forehead disappeared. She leaned back in her chair, laughed, throwing her head back. <sighs> what a show you put on. Okay, fine. I confess. I did steal your cupcake. Huh? I mean, am I supposed to? I barely see you lately. So, sweet pastries are my best shot to get some fun at night. What? Damn, I didn't realize you still remembered that cupcakes even exist. It was lying around the fridge for what? Three days? Hope glanced at Ethan, expecting him to start laughing too. That he still looked very serious. She noticed for the first time that the whites of his eyes were pinkish and full of broken capillaries. Her smile slowly faded. Come on, maybe you've left the keys unattended somewhere? I always leave my keys when I'm in the office. But I'm pretty sure there's no cat burglars among my colleagues. You sure about that? 
comes to think of it, we should have hired a bunch. Hmm. Gotta balance the risk of going broke we have on a monthly basis. Are you sure none of your colleagues would play a joke on us? A joke? Good God, Ethan. You look like you're about to eat me alive. Take a bun instead. <laughs> Tastes better, trust me. No pulled her chair closer to Ethan and took his hand. Please, hon. Promise me you'll take a break after that project of yours is finished. I mean... One psycho is enough for our family. Was that meant to imply that you're a psycho, Hope? Should I be concerned? You promise. Ethan suddenly felt like a total idiot. A tired total idiot. A naked girl in her kitchen? Yeah, sure. He probably overworked to the point he started being delirious at times. He even walked in his sleep. He squeezed Hope's fingers lightly. I promise. Sorry, I'm a moron. I probably stopped seeing the difference between dream and reality. Why don't you call Laura? No, a shrink is the last thing I need right now. My bad, sure. But that'd just be too cruel. I need to finish that project. After all, all the gears in my head will fall into place. I give you my word. Oh, don't be like that. I mean, there's no need to start full-fledged therapy anyway. Sometimes, talking through your worries with a professional is all it takes to feel better. At least I shouldn't have pressed you on it. I get that you have enough problems of your own right now. How's it going in your new position? I pressed her head on his shoulder and shrugged. Not fired yet, apparently. Seriously, though, I haven't figured it out yet. Those new responsibilities are exciting, oh, but I always feel like I'm ten times slower than I should be. I should probably get ready for a nice, fat piece of overtime by the end of the month. You think kissed her forehead, closed his eyes, and squeezed the bridge of his nose. Well, I'm not a head of department as of yet, but I seem to have the same stuff on my plate. Just how do you manage not to pester me with stupid questions? Well, I eat cupcakes at night. You should give it a try. Hope poked to Ethan's said cheek a couple of times with her finger. Anyway, don't worry. I didn't give keys to anyone, and the only cat anything I've let inside was an actual stray cat. You let inside a stray cat? Hello? Hmm. Now that I think of it, it's been ages since we had any company. Maybe we should. A cat? What cat? Hope sighed and pulled away. Please don't get all worked up, okay? At least I'm being open with you. Don't worry, she didn't wander around. Was she dancing around in the kitchen, though? Hope, oh, we've talked this over already. We've talked over what? The fact that what I want doesn't really matter? Damn it, Hope. This is my apartment, and I... And you're staying here alone now? Don't finish her tea in a couple of gulps. I have to go to the office. She stopped at the door, not turning around. Sorry about the cat. She was really skinny, and I felt sorry for her. I also feel sorry for myself, Ethan, because I'm lonely. Mm -hmm. Really lonely. This time, Ethan felt like an angry idiot. He got up from the table and reached for hope. Hope I don't. I'll start crying. It'll take time. And I don't have any to spare right now. See you tonight. See you tonight. 
He didn't know what else to say, so he followed Hope into the hall like a silent shadow. He thought the right words would come to him, but the entrance door closed and he remained silent. Ethan sighed. He regretted his decision to talk about the night episode. He regretted how the talk turned out. He felt sorry for himself. And for Hope. After all, Ethan was well aware of that. He really didn't spend enough time with her. At first because of the agency project, now because of the question to which he still could not find an answer. It was time to end this. He's going to make some coffee, then he'll open the laptop and write up some answer. It won't be an accurate one, but it's really time to finish that work marathon. After all, he doesn't even get paid for his time. Ethan nodded to the closed door and turned around, ready to execute the plan. That's when he saw her. Just for a split second, but damn it, he saw her. The cat? A black-haired girl flashed in the doorway of one of the rooms. Not even flashed, but drifted. Like a... Ethan's mouth went dry. Shadow. Of course there was no one in the room. This has gone too far. Ethan had gone too far, but he couldn't turn back, even though he was going to. He didn't even make any coffee. He wanted to get rid of that question, get a good night's sleep, and forget about the whole thing. Forget about the shadow that danced in his kitchen. Forget about the pale silhouette that wandered out through his apartment. Forget that at this very moment someone is looking at the back of his head. And that look makes his skin feel as cold as the kitchen floor last night. And the hairs, one by one, stand on end. Ethan clenched his teeth. Not with anger, but with some new emotion he couldn't name. The blood hummed in his ears louder and louder. Well, I'll be over after he writes the letter. I'll be over. He opened his laptop, his hands were shaking a little, and was putting his fingers over the keyboard when his cell phone rang. Ethan flinched. He stared blankly for a few seconds as the vibrating rectangle of glass and plastic crawled across the table. Don't. Do not answer. Don't do it. Suddenly, he grabbed the phone and pushed the accept button. Ethan himself didn't know how that happened. He just did it, that's all. The phone pressed tight against his ear. He waited for a hoarse, gurgling sound to call his name and tell him to look behind. Or what is supposed to happen in cases like this? Ethan? Hope? <laughs> Were you expecting someone else, you dolt? Okay, sorry. I'm super uneasy, and so I'm talking nonsense. Yes, I'm uneasy too. And that's completely true. I just... Look, am I distracting you right now? You are, and I'm very happy about that. Go on, please. That's great. Hmm. Look, it didn't come off well at breakfast, right? Yes. I'm sorry, I'm being awful. No, I'm sorry. Both of us have it hard now, so let's... Let's try not to fight, okay? Great idea. Why don't we go out tonight? Save for groceries? Counts as going out, if you ask me. I'll go crazy being cooped up like that. No, oh, so that's what's driving me nuts. To go out for zucchini more often. So what do you say? Okay, we're gonna buy all the zucchini tonight. Hope laughed. Ethan suddenly realized that the blood wasn't buzzing in his ears. No one was looking at the back of his head. And if he turned around, he would only see Hope's socks that she'd left on the chair again. Hope. Hmm? I love you. I love you too, very much. See you tonight. 
After finishing the call, he turned around. The socks were resting peacefully on the chair, which meant everything was okay. He went back to the mail and only then noticed several new letters. Two of them were from his counterpart. Ethan hesitated. He already decided his course of action concerning the question, so there was no harm in taking a look. He won't feel any guilt. After all, he already done far more than he should have. Of course, he is a lifesaver for those wanting to sell books mentioning historical accuracy, but having no intention to pay for it properly. And so what? He doesn't have to do a perfect job for free. Hell, he doesn't even work for free. That's what Ethan thought. That he opened the two letters he got and changed his highly reasonable decision. His counterpart was asking how soon he would get an answer. So, this happened, after all. The tone was very polite and apologetic. He wasn't expecting anything, but he really, really needed the help of someone competent. According to the emails, he wasn't doing very well. The poor man had been suffering from insomnia for an insane amount of time, it seems that he, too, began imagining things. It was as if Ethan saw himself from the outside. He suddenly felt very sorry for his acquaintance. Of course, he had begun to feel sorry for him earlier, but now Ethan felt a sharp, bitter pity. He realized that if he helps his acquaintance, he will help himself, but if he steps back now, what is the value of a specialist who is afraid of a little challenge? As Hope once said, the career ladder is made of thorn. Of course, he no longer worked in the office, but professional growth requires twice as much effort if you're self-employed. So true! And besides, Ethan had Hope. Heh. <laughs> Hope, who never gives in so easily, forgets her socks on the chair. Hope, who loves him very much. Hope, who will go to the store with him tonight, because being cooped up like that can drive one crazy. This must be what be happening to his acquaintance right now. Ethan had to help him. Not because of money, but because he could, and because it was the right thing to do. They'll both finish their projects, and they'll have a good rest. They might even go out for a glass of beer together. So Ethan thought, and got back to the question with a newfound strength. The pages of the books did not rustle in the far corner of the room. The shadows weren't wandering in the corridor, and certainly no one looked at the back of his head until the evening. And in the evening, Hope came back. Hope looked up from her magazine and leaned over the armrest. You had a call from the agency? Ethan just got back from the shower. He froze in place, clutching his towel at his waist. Something cold stirred uncomfortably in his stomach. The project. He had completely forgotten about the agency project. It had been more than two weeks. The deadline was very close. He started for the phone, but Hope just waved her hand lazily. Don't worry, I picked it. What did you tell them? I told them you'd stop eating, sleeping, and loving anything other than work, so they'll get those files all nice and shiny. Pretty accurate, huh? Yeah. Just don't pick up my phone again, okay? Nope, shrugged. Sure. I mean, it was you who asked me to answer the calls in the first place. Yes, I know. When I just started working for them, it was important to let them see I'm always in touch. Now that I've passed the probation period, there's no point in piling this on you any longer. Thank you for covering for me. No problem. If you're getting a call, and I'm not too lazy to go pick it up, I can watch your back. No, you really shouldn't. This project is... complicated. I'd rather deal with it myself. Ethan sat rigid. He never considered himself a good liar, but Hope didn't seem to notice anything. She sighed, pretending to be upset, and rolled her eyes. Well now. 
Guess I'm being fired from an unpaid security position without any honors or compensation. Capitalism sucks. Ethan leaned over, tucked a strand of blonde hair behind her ear, and looked into her eyes. His hand remained on Hope's cheek. Your help was very important to me. Hope's hand went over his. She closed her eyes. I know. I couldn't have done it without you. What else is new? They kissed. When Hope pulled away, she looked pleased, a sly smile on her lips. Are we still going to the store? Mm, I'm not sure. They reached for each other again, but the phone gave a shrill ring. After the phone call this morning, Keith had turned the silent mood off. Oh well. My city needs me. Ethan briefly pressed his lips to her forehead. Hope sighed and slapped his ass. If God existed, he'd really want us to buy some zucchinis. I'll go and get dressed. And the call was from the agency. They needed more details and dates. Ethan went out into the hallway and tried to make it sound as plausible as he could. Yes, he understands that the deadline is very close. No, there is no serious hitches in the work. Yes, he'll send everything on time. When the call finally ended, Ethan's neck and face were flushed by this time. He was a lousy liar, after all. Ethan had to catch his breath. When he returned to the room, Hope was reaching for his laptop. What are you doing? Hope glanced at him over the shoulder. This time, she looked surprised. Nothing special, really. I just wanted to print out some discount coupons. What about it? Ethan left a bunch of files and tabs open. They had nothing to do with the agency project, and he didn't want Hope to see them. After all, she didn't know enough about his projects to serve as a sort of secretary. It's a lot. I don't know why I was saying that's a lot, too, actually. <laughs> about all the projects, even the one that Ethan shouldn't have taken because it wasn't paid for. Maybe his fears were irrational. Maybe Hope wouldn't blame him. But Ethan felt ashamed, and he didn't want to take any chances after what had happened this morning. I have lots of unsaved files in there. Some important information might get lost. Can I print those coupons myself? Ethan felt the heat rise again his neck and cheeks. Hump stared at him for a few seconds. Ethan couldn't read the expression on her face, and that creeped him out. He was ready to hear the reproaches. He even agreed with them in his mind, but Hope simply walked away. Sure. I'll send them to your mail. They spent most of their... Blah, 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 blah. They spent most of the way to this tour in tense silence. A few times Ethan asked something, just to make sure Hope was still talking to him. Oh boy. Hope was, though the answers were dry and she never even attempted to make a joke. It's not that bad, Ethan told himself. It's not that bad at all. If you repeat it again and again, you can buy a little time, but the anxiety will prevail. It always does. Ethan's mind quickly figured out the owner was trying to trick it and spat in the chewing gum. At that moment, Ethan got caught in an avalanche of thoughts he didn't want to deal with and couldn't in, in his current state of reading. Something had to be done, to be said, but what? Maybe he should actually do something after all? Ethan imagined touching Hope's fingers, and he immediately saw her pulling the hand back, her eyes glistening, as she opens her mouth to ask the question Ethan had no answer to. They'd have to talk, one way or another. 
Ethan didn't know where to start without burying himself even deeper. He had been thinking about it the whole way, but never came up with anything. In the huge supermarket on the next block, a place they had long dubbed the store, was bustling with life, despite the rather late hour. As soon as they entered the large glass doors, the tension began to come off on its own. The carts were scarce, but Ethan got them when in exchange for a coupon. Hope gave him a thumbs up with, not bad, not bad at all, expression on her face. Hope enthusiastically presented a huge, colorful, utterly ludicrous mug, and Ethan immediately agreed that they had to buy it. They tried to find a pair for the mug, but a brooding supermarket employee said it was the last one. They were a little disappointed, but, well, at least that was something. Looking for the mug was the thing that finally did the trick. Now they were huddled together, looking for their favorite treats, and arguing about which breakfast cereals were the best. And that's how it was until they reached the meat department. I'll go pick something out before it's all cleared. Hope nodded absently. She was stuck at one of the big fridges in the middle of the hall. Okay. I'll be waiting for you here. The meat shelves were half empty, as usual at this hour. Ethan was hoping to find a steak or some minced meat. However, he soon forgot about both. Is it that damn cat again? There was a girl standing by one of the shelves. Ethan couldn't see her face. Only her pale back under a white dress with thin straps, and also her disheveled dark hair. Ethan's cheek was strung with cold, as if his face was lying on the shelf in one of those refrigerated display cases. Just between the pork ribs and a little ribeye in a black polystyrene foam tray. Is that... her? Ethan took a few uncertain steps forward. Then he backed away, almost knocking over a nice old lady who couldn't even muster an apology. Grabbed the first thing that came to hand and turned around to the nearest row of shelves. He tried not to run. Because it would have looked too stupid, Ethan explained to himself as he reached the end of the row and peered around the corner. The girl was still picking out meat. Isn't what you're supposed to- Isn't what you're doing now, stupid too? For sure it is, Ethan agreed with himself. The cold no longer burned his cheek on the girl. The girl seemed quite ordinary. Except she was dressed too lightly for the current weather. That still wasn't considered a crime in any of the states. Ethan smiled to his own thoughts. Generally speaking, the girl was rather attractive, and her light clothing allowed one to fully appreciate it. Her thin waist, passing into a seductive curve of her hips, and beneath the folds of white fabric, one could make out her rounded buttocks. That's nice. Fun. B what? I was asking broccoli or Brussels sprouts. Hope stood still with two colorful plastic bags in her hands, looking at Ethan questioningly. He blinked several times, squinting as if he had just stepped out of into the bright light from the darkened room. When did he get back to Hope? Why was he holding a bottle of Thousand Islands dressing? I, I don't know. He was a little dizzy. Are you alright? Yeah. No, you're not, dude. Yeah, never mind. I'm sorry. I was just lost in thought. I'll try not to look in the direction Ethan had been focusing on for so long. She really tried, but sometimes trying isn't enough, no matter how much effort you put in. At that very moment, the dark-haired girl's light white dress was floating away from the meat shelves. She must have finally made her choice. I see. For a moment, Ethan thought both colorful plastic bags were about to slap him in the face. Would have been deserved. 
but Hope just smiled and tossed the bags into the cart. She just sees a cat, doesn't she? Hmm. Ethan heard them crunch loudly as they hit the bottom. Well, let's take a bath. Variety is the spice of life. What is a man without his zucchini? What is that? What is that supposed to mean? <laughs> Little achievements. They haven't bought any zucchini. Shameful. The night he had another dream about the white room. The walls were still trembling softly in the cold light. Everything in the room including the air, was oozing tension, and pushing in anticipation of what was about to happen. And something was really about to happen, no doubt about it. Ethan suddenly realized he was looking at the room from an odd angle. He seemed to be standing on something, but he couldn't feel anything under his feet, no support. He tried to look down, but only saw the shimmering air. He had no legs. And nothing above the missing legs. As if he was not there. Or rather, he was the shimmering air. He chipped the ceiling and the walls that were still trembling. He was the red sofa standing a little away from the center, and a couple of unremarkable white doors on opposite walls of the room that were not there the last time. And that should not have been there. Nothing can be done about it now. The doors have appeared, and there's nothing that can be done about it now. The light grew dim, now pulsating noticeably. It was still emanating from the room in its entirety, reflecting from the white walls, but was the wall, with a twin bra on the wall between two doors that were not supposed to be. For some reason, Ethan tried to catch the rhythm of the light with his breath, yet he could have. There were two figures sitting on the sofa. One fair, the other dark. The dark one came into the room through one of the doors, but Ethan couldn't guess which one. The fair one was Hope. What are you doing here? You can't be here. You have to leave right now or something will happen. The pulse of light became faster. The dark one moved towards Hope and tucked a blonde strand behind her ear. Everything was happening very slowly, as if underwater. There was something odd about the dark one. She's a cat. Something about her was wrong, but Ethan couldn't guess what. She's a cat. She leaned towards Hope's ear and covered her mouth with her hand, and Hope leaned towards her and listened very carefully, as if they had a mutual secret amongst themselves. Something was about to happen. They both looked at Ethan, even though Ethan wasn't here, or rather he was nowhere, because no white room ever existed. Then one of them smiled. The dark one's finger slid down Hope's chin, a soft rounded line. They were no longer looking at Ethan, only at each other, very closely, and were slowly inhaling the light. Oh my. The dark one struck Hope's cheek, and there was no light left between their ajar lips as they collided. Ethan saw drops of saliva glistening on their lips. The dark one licked her lips and raised her tongue to make space for a long black snake as it got out of her mouth. The snake swayed, tasted the air with its own tongue, and reached out to Hope. Hope closed her eyes. Now the snake was stroking her cheek, long and black, over and over again in a spiral, always in a spiral. Wait, is it her, like, tail? Because she's a cat, after all. I don't know what's going on, man. Hope reached for the band that covered her eyes, and the dark girl reached for her hand, 
and their fingers intertwined and the light between their lips melted, as it always happens at sunset. Blah, 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 blah. As it always happens at sunset. Yet there was no snake. It was just a black ribbon and a poisonous ribbon covered in scales. The pulse of the room became faster. One of the lamps came into an eclipse. She has a number of faces. That's a clue. The bodies of the two girls merged on the red sofa, and his own flesh was shaking and shrinking. Ligaments, valves, bones, vessels in places where they came very close to the shabby red upholstery. As her rate became faster, 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 and then something happened. Ethan woke up. His breath was bubbling in his throat. Enjoying it so far, wait. <laughs> the ceiling above him was flaring with immeasurable darkness, and down below his stomach he felt a searing heat. The heat was so intense that Ethan had to sneak into the bathroom, and as his old man used to say, he had to squeeze it off. Not just once, but whopping too. After that, Ethan loomed over the sink and was looking at himself in a small rectangular mirror for quite a while. At some point, his lips started trembling. Ethan did not wait to see where this was going. He spat into the sink, let the water in for a while, then he turned the lights off. Ethan didn't want morning to come. Something's changed, oh boy. What's here now with the tomato soup? The devil's in the tomato soup. How to make the tomato soup? Oh boy. Let's find out how to make the tomato soup. Oh. She got lost. It's legal, but it's painful still. Tell comes in for the little cracks they don't tell you at school. Okay. No time to cook? We've got an answer on the shelf. Tomato soup. Made with fresh tomatoes and... And... I wish you'd never been born. I mean... Well, that's very nice. May 3rd. Mom is acting funny, and smells funny too. She says she loves me all the time, but I'm a little bit redacted when she's like that. February 13th. An awful day. I was just crazy- I was crazy scared for mom. She says she'll have some days off and will be watching movies and eating waffles. I love that, but she looks very sad. I don't know what to do. Interesting, interesting. You didn't want to wake up, to see a hidden grudge in Hope's eyes, to listen to the awkward silence and to seize every opportunity to say a word to break it. But morning did come, and Ethan was in for a surprise. Everything was fine. Very much so. Hope got up early to make a superior breakfast, the kind Ethan was never able to cook, even when he really wanted to. She was talking to him. She was joking. She listed at least 10 places they would go when their schedules became more relaxed. The nightmare seemed to be over. Simply washed away what the blah, 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 blah. Simply washed away down the drain with the rest of the all things excess he used to have in his body. The image was so real that Ethan got completely relaxed, let his guard down, dazed by the cute nonsense, muffled with cream and delicious Turkish coffee. Then Hope asked a question. Do you think a darker hair color would suit me? Please don't become a cat. The coffee suddenly turned solid and stuck in his throat. Ethan felt as if it wasn't coffee at all, but finally ground glass. He coughed. What? I put her elbows on the table and sipped from her cup as if nothing had happened. I was just thinking of becoming a brunette. What do you say, huh? I don't know. I, 
I'm fine with everything as it is. As long as you like it, I guess. Tiny pieces of glass were still scratching him from the inside. He then tried to clear his throat, but it didn't get much better. But why? Were you thinking about it? Ethan struggled to speak. He felt as if he was falling into a pit and the air was whistling in his ears. Well, one has to change from time to time. Variety is good. Isn't that right? She took another sip. Besides, I find plenty of dark hair all over the apartment. It's because of that damn cat. Not very long, you know, but not too short either. About this length? Even before Hope tapped to her neck with the edge of her hand, Ethan knew where the hand would stop. And so I thought, if I go brunette, I can believe those hairs are mine. Hope's lips stretched and the corners of her mouth turned up. But she wasn't smiling. This isn't happening. This just can't be happening. You must still be asleep. This is a dream. Just a shitty dream in one end. Now I think desperately wanted morning to come. But morning just couldn't come for the second time in a day. Hope leaned back in her chair and looked at him with her head on one side. A fake smile smoldering on her lips. Something had to be done about it. All of it. Right this moment. Come up with an explanation. Try to explain. Let's try to explain the cat thing. Yeah. He's not good at lying anyway, so... Look, something strange is going on. Yeah. I could tell as much. Hope, I'm serious. Something strange is going on, and I have no explanations. Neither good nor bad. None at all. Oh, really? Actually, I have an idea or two. A cat? Wait. I'm not saying that yesterday in the store. Ethan stopped short. Go on. He took a deep breath and closed his eyes. I'm not saying I didn't stare at that girl. I did, and it's obvious. I was trying to... She reminds me of someone. I was trying to figure out if I was mistaken. I know what it looks like, and it's my fault. Ethan decided to move the part about well-rounded buttocks under the light-flowing fabric. Good call, good call. Not because he wanted to look better, but because he knew it would hurt Hope, and he really didn't want to hurt her. Please forgive me if you can. I did a shitty thing, but I'm really sorry. He put his hand on the table so that the fingers touched a little. Hope didn't move away. Next time we go shopping, you can stare at everyone you like. I'll try my best not to cry. Can't promise anything, though. Hope winced, but Ethan knew she was hiding a smile. Alright, then. But keep in mind, I'll pick the hottest ones. I don't stand a chance, do I? She smiled wider and ruffled his hair. Absolutely. And about the hairs. Hope's smile disappeared without a trace. I don't know where they came from. Seriously, there's something wrong here. Ethan, please. I don't want to. No, listen, please. I really think that some intruder is getting inside our apartment somehow. Do you believe me? Hope looked at him for a while. Then she shivered. Damn you, Ethan. Yes. I do believe you. I don't understand how this happens or what they want, but I think it's time to call the police. And let them sort it out. It's their job, after all. Maybe you should actually call Laura first. I think it's the time. Yeah, I'll do that as well. Hope pressed his hand. Let's promise each other we won't go crazy, okay? I 
also see things. Not you too. All sorts of things. I mean, sometimes you find hair, just some damn hairs, and you start questioning everything. We just need to get through these dark times somehow. It'll get better. I'm sure it will. Ethan nodded. Yeah. I pressed his hand again and got up from the table. Okay. I have to go now. No, don't leave. The cat will come back. I'll probably be late. And we'll have to hold up at work today. Should I meet you after? Maybe... I'll call you later, I guess. Hope. Hmm? I love you. I love you too. Very much. Don't forget to call Laura. Ethan nodded absently. When the door shut behind Hope, Ethan called Laura. Hope found Laura a long time ago. Seemed like Laura helped her a lot. At least that's what Hope herself said. Ethan didn't know any details, nor wanted to, since Hope hadn't told him. After all, psychotherapy is a very personal matter. So personal that Ethan felt as if he were standing naked in the middle of a busy street when he had to describe what was happening to him. Apparently, Hope can get used to this too, as the middle of the story he was sparing no details. To Ethan's surprise, when he mentioned the disturbing emails from his contact that were starting to that were kind of getting on his nerves, Laura perked up. You're saying you have recently become quite close to your acquaintance. You empathize and try to help him, right? Well, yes. Something like that. And your contact's letters contained vivid, disturbing imagery, yes? Imagery that evoked a certain response from you, is that right? You could say that. He's a writer, after all. Vivid images are his livelihood. Do you know what induced delusional disorder is, Mr. Harrison? Ethan tried to recall. He definitely read about it, but didn't look into too much detail. Is that the thing that explains mass insanity? Like that dancing play go 1518 in Stratzborg? That's right. This disorder is also called Fode I Do, or Madness for Two. Sounds romantic, doesn't it? Or I giggled. Ethan thought she herself was not all too sane. Of course she wasn't. She has to deal with the guys like me all the time. Well, Laura had already returned to her usual tone, calm and measured. This condition causes perfectly healthy people to experience various... Let's say, negative effects. It works like this. We have a source of delirium, and those who perceive it, one or more people. As you correctly noted, sometimes this disorder can take on a truly massive scale. There's usually an emotional connection between the victims of this connection. Ref is also at risk, unfortunately. Laura paused. We can make diagnosis in such a format, Dr. Mr. Harrison. However, I think you need to limit your contact with your acquaintance, at least for the time being. You might be the source of the unpleasant state you were experiencing. Would you like to make an appointment for a consultation? Ethan politely declined. Laura listened to the rest of what he had to say. She asked what pills Ethan was taken. taking. Ethan wasn't taking any except to aspirin, because he had lots of headaches lately. She advised him to reduce the workload, follow the daily routine, and take light sedatives if necessary. Something herbal, maybe. Without meeting a person, there wasn't much Laura could offer. Ethan had no energy, time, or money to start full-on therapy, as Hope called it. Ethan thanked Laura with all his heart, finished the call, stretched, and took a deep breath that made his ribs ache. Then he smiled. Though no full-on therapy was involved, this conversation still made Ethan feel much better. 
The reality made sense again, and nothing out of the ordinary was happening. Nothing he couldn't handle. He stretched again and was about to go out for another cup of coffee. When his breath, the steady deep breath of a man who's in control, caught in his throat. Ethan felt the small hairs of his neck standing up. Someone was looking at the back of his head. Ethan turned around slowly. I'm calling the police. Ethan spoke each word loud and clear. It was a decent plan. An actually decent one, and it certainly wasn't funny in any way. And yet, the girl sitting on the windowsill was silently laughing, covering her white teeth with her hand. Cat. Yep, it's the cat girl, right? The girl from the supermarket. The girl from the dream. She was still wearing a light white dress, even though in the morning the temperature dropped to 53 degrees Fahrenheit and it was going to rain. One of the straps fell down to the side, but the girl was in no hurry to put it back. She swung her crossed legs a little, looking at Ethan from under her brow, with the smile of a child who had a hilarious mischief in mind. Did I say something funny? The girl quickly raised her eyes and shrugged slightly. <gasps> Still holding back the smile. Just as before, she did not make a sound. Ethan even assumed she couldn't be mute and decided to make one last attempt. Just one question, and then he calls the cops. Who are you? How did you get in here? Um, I feel like both questions kind of suck, but what do you think? I feel like how did you get in here has the most potential to be funny, but who you are might actually answer some questions. So you're gonna have to go with how did you get in here? Alright. The girl put her lean finger with a neat black nail to her lips, while the fingers of her other hands shaped a figure of a man. Huh? She pointed out the figure with her eyes. Ethan felt sick of the farce that was happening. He thought he should call the cops immediately. The hand clutching the phone continued to hang limply. The finger man looked around and started walking along the window slope with his finger legs. One, two, three. Then something else happened. Ethan failed to understand what it was. The next moment, the finger man was walking on the sill, and the girl was making it with her other hand. Then she smiled widely and put two palms on her chest. Both palms on her chest. She looked absolutely happy. I was invited! Mm-hmm. Suddenly... She cast a gloomy look at Ethan. Her black eyes gave a gold, cold glimmer. It's really rude to come in without an invitation. Oh boy, she has multiple voices. A moment later, the girl reached for something behind her back. She quickly pulled it up to her lips and took a sip. Ethan's throat became tight with blood that absolutely rushed to his head. Where... How did he get this? The girl traced Ethan's gesture with a dreamily surprised look. In the next moment, she parted her fingers. That's nice. Hope's huge colorful cup, the one they just got at the store, tinkled hurtfully as it struck the floor, and then shattered to pieces. Just like that. There was a brief moment when the cup was lying peacefully on the floor. Ethan got enough time to hope it would endure the fall. She is so definitely a cat, yeah. And then the fragments burst everywhere at once, as the furious white light broke out from the inside. But no, that was milk. Just some milk. Milk inside of a bag of milk inside of a bag of milk inside of a bag of milk. You shouldn't have spooked me, you know. Now look at what you've done. The poor cup is so, so broken. So many eeny, meeny, tiny pieces. There's no way to mend it at all. <laughs> Ethan was suffocating. What the hell are you doing here? What do you want from me? The girl bit her lip and twisted a fallen shoulder strap between fingers. The top of the dress slid even lower. 
<laughs> Don't tell me the game's gonna have him cry over spilled milk. That'd be funny. Do you want me to leave? But I may run into hope. Right at the door, even. She forgot her pass. We'll be here any minute. What will the poor girl think? Why is she sticking out her ass like that? God damn. The girl looked over her shoulder and her face instantly lit up. Why did you... It's her. Okay. Here she is! Because she has a cat and Ethan is delusional. So true. Hope is simply amazing. Accurate to a minute. Hello, hello! The girl turned over her stomach. Leaned on the sill and waved vigorously to someone invis invisible. Her dress completely slid down. That's nice. That bitch. Ethan would bet her tits are flashing right through the window. Track her away from the window. Don't come any closer. Um. <laughs> she a homewrecker, so true. Um. Man, uh... I'm gonna go for Don't Come Any Closer and see what happens. Ah. Uh. Ethan couldn't see it, but he knew. He felt that Hope was really standing down there, and she was looking at the window, of course. Although she couldn't see it much anymore, and a blurry veil covered her eyes. I could have done a save and I didn't. Oh well. The girl slowly turned around and stared at him with her eyes wide open, without blinking. Her shoulders shook as if she was going to cry, but she was laughing. At first, it was a couple of stifled laughs. Then, it became a laughter of someone who just heard a great joke gradually turned into wild barking screams. He has to stop it. Right now. Ethan wanted to rush to the window, but took just one step and froze in place. That girl must be out of her mind. She's stoned, or worse, a cat. She might have a syringe, and he doesn't want any more problems. He only wants this thing removed from his windowsill, welded in a steel box and dumped somewhere in the middle of Atlantic. He still has his phone in his hand. That's nice. 911, what's the address of your emergency? Bitch drank, hunched, but kept cackling like a pack of coyotes, yelping on the moonlit night. She was writh writhing with laughter, and the pale rags of dry, flabby skin were shaking the rhythm of her movements, or just looking like a death shroud. He only thought she was much older than he thought at first. What is going on? Ethan looked at her for the last time, a mixture of hate and disgust in his eyes, and turned away, running his fingers through his hair. There's a stranger in my apartment. A woman, most likely on drugs or just insane. Can you see her right now? Ethan could, only, could see only the wall in front of him, but he heard a deafening howl. It was echoing throughout his skull, beating into his temporal bones like a desperate bird. Ethan clenched his teeth. Yes. Does she have a weapon? Maybe. She threatened me. Can you leave the apartment? No. The scum can escape, and I don't want her to get... Ethan hesitated. I can't hear you. Sir, what is happening? Speak up, I can't hear you. What is happening? Terrifying laughter kept echoing in Ethan's ears. That felt like a bad ending. There was no one behind him. There, not an ending? Still going? Okay. I wonder what happened to the first guy. You know, he... He approached the window slowly, as if it was happening in a dream. The shreds of Hope's cup crunched under his feet. Just like before, the window was closed. 
You then opened it and carefully looked down. You did not see the body, too good to be true, but you had to check. Only the gray pavement, which gradually turned black as it actually started raining. You then looked across the street, just in time to notice the familiar cream-colored coat disappearing behind the corner of the nearby house. Hope. Hope! He screamed so loud that something snapped in his throat, but she didn't hear him. Maybe she didn't want to hear. Ethan called her at least a hundred times. Hope didn't answer. Ethan thought he could come to her office, but eventually decided to only make things worse. The police were in his apartment 23 minutes, so 40 seconds later. They didn't find any signs of forced entry in the call record, as Ethan found out later, had nothing that resembled laughter or howling. No extraneous sounds, as the officer said. Hope returned sometime between late at night and early in the morning. The skin on her cheekbones was taut and almost transparent, and there were deep shadows under her eyes, as if she hadn't slept in a long time. She smelled a strong alcohol. Ethan went out of the dark room to her. He didn't sleep and didn't turn on the light either. Things that looked in the dark, Miller imagined, no longer frightened him. He even wished that something he had been dreading for the past month, he finally could name the feeling he had, would come out of the greasy blackness of the shadows and snap his neck. But everything in the apartment was mockingly calm, except for Ethan himself. Hope. Hope stared at him in silence, swaying a little. Instead of pupils, she had dark holes. I've been thinking a lot what I should say to you if you came back. What I can say. Hope's face showed no emotion. It seemed like she didn't even blink. Anyway, I realized that I can only tell the truth, no matter how crazy it sounds. If I try to cheat, it only gets worse, right? Ethan gave a short, nervous laugh. Anyway, Ethan had plenty of time to think about what he was going to say, but he still didn't know where to start. Some time ago, I don't remember exactly, I started seeing a girl. Who is she, Ethan? I don't know. Is it Sophie? Who? Sophie Wolf. Your student from that online course. Hope made a fake gesture with her hand. Movies from the late Victorian era. Ethan didn't know why he said that, but Hope obediently repeated in a flat voice. I remember you were impressed with her. You always liked smart girls. And this one was also beautiful. Hope, this isn't- this isn't what you think. Think. Who says, I think? Thinking's too painful. Wait, hold on. Ethan disappeared into the room and came back a few minutes later. The darkness of the hallway was diluted by the light of the screen. Hope covered her eyes with her hand, either from the brightness of the screen itself or because she didn't want to see whatever there was. What is it all about? Here, look. It's Sophie Wolf. On the screen, in fact, was the profile of Sophie Wolf, a student. On the photo, Sophie was squinting, either from the bright sun or because her curly red hair was getting in her eyes. A small brown haired girl snuggled up to her with a shy smile. They're a nice couple. If I remember right, they had a wedding this year. Then... Who is... I don't know. And honestly, I don't care. I just want her out of my life, but this bitch follows me. Well, she used to follow. Now I don't think... I don't think I'll ever see her again. Is it good or bad? Hope, please. 
If you want to leave, I'll understand. But if... If you're willing to give me a chance, I promise I'll do my best to mend it all. He couldn't really promise, but he was too eager for the nightmare Miller imagined to finally end. No more weird stories. Please, hope. I don't need anyone but you. If you can get... He couldn't finish because Hope kissed him. Her back hit the floor with a thud. The rest of the night actually went fine. Well, even more than that. Except for the fact they were too busy to get any sleep. Uh-huh. Oh dear. That was nice. At least everything was going okay until the moment when, instead of Hope's face, just for a moment, Ethan saw. He couldn't tell her. He mumbled something about not feeling well and collapsed on his back, panting. He closed his eyes so that Hope wouldn't accidentally catch a glimpse of what he saw. Nothing happened. It wasn't real. It's fine. She understands, said Hope. Something changed. Oh boy. What's on the TV program now? That's nice. I remember her face. Uh-huh. Where's Timu? Let's look for him together. Maybe he's up with the tree chasing the birds? No, I can't see him. Maybe he's on the reeds watching the fish. No, and no. Let's look some more. Maybe he's on the roadside under the blue plastic bag? He's not there. 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 He is there. He's not 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 there. He is there. He's not there. He's not there. He's not there. He's not there. He is there. He's not there. He's not there. He's not there. He's not there. That's nice. Love that for us. The conditions of love. What have you done? I wanted to save you. I wanted to save us both. You fool. That's right. But I just can't lose you. It is too late. It's never too late as long as we have each other. Oh, Elijah. The conditions of love. That's nice. Hmm. June 11th. I had a really weird dream today. Hope redacted is okay. I'll go and look for him. And still close the darn window. Is it raining? The concave muzzles of Persian cats stared back at him. All that was required of Ethan, he had to call the cattery. A simple task, but Ethan hesitated. It was hard for him to get used to the idea of one of those pop-eyed creatures walking around their apartment. During the day, he'll nap where it pleases, and at night, sneak into the kitchen to play with the shadows that move by themselves. And its eyes will turn into two saucers of black and green dark if the light reaches them. Ancient people believed cats could walk between worlds and see spirits. Looking at Persians, Ethan hardly believed they could even breathe on their own. I mean. And yet, in this Ethan Harrison from the 21st century agreed with the ancient people. There was something sinister about them. In any case, he should call the cattery. For hope's sake. For the sake of them both, since he had made the decision. <gasps> Ethan had barely picked up the phone and was about to proceed with the plan when he heard the key turn at the entrance door. Something about that wound him up. It was barely five o'clock in the evening, which was, in any way, very early for Hope to be back. 
If everything was fine, that is. Ethan closed his laptop and went out into the hallway. For a long time, he couldn't say a single word, and when he could speak again, he only managed to want a question. What have you done? Hope's smile faded. For the first time in the four and a half, or even five years they've been a couple, Ethan was glad of it. In fact, there was nothing surprising about it. As of the new haircut and the new hair color, Hope looked unbearably and seemingly similar to the creature out the window. Hope's lips turned white, trembling. This didn't help, did it? Any of it? You can't love me even now, right? What are you talking about? Isn't it obvious? I see how you look at me. You're disgusted. You try your best to touch me as little as possible. And no matter what I do, no matter what I try, it doesn't help. Admit it. You never loved her. Mmm, I love distorted voices. You didn't write Ethan. She was convenient, and that's about it. Shit makes the flowers grow. The flowers grew so much, didn't I? Ethan, didn't I? Ethan would never hit his wife. More than that, he would never hit a woman. But what spoke to him was neither his wife nor a woman. It was a nightmare incarnate that bared its long, sharp teeth, came to take away his right for a second chance. Or so Ethan thought at the time. The punch turned out somewhat pathetic. But you, you have to take into account that wife beating is not a fairground attraction. When you hit your wife properly, a mark does not fly up to the highlighted sign a good one. While well, this is only indirectly related to the early renaissance, Ethan had expertise in the manner, since his old man's fist used to itch often. There was something like that, he would know. However, if any sign could light up at the moment, he would say something like, You're a scum, Ethan. No. He kept repeating that even after Hope stormed out, in the, uh, the, the, stormed out the door in tears. Ethan barely remembered the following few days. Something seemed to be happening. Some people called him. He himself called a lot. He called Hope. Hope wasn't answering the phone. He knew this would happen. Every time he dialed her number, he knew he'll end up listening to the voicemail signal. It became something of a ritual. He would wake up. Sometimes it was light outside, sometimes dark, but more often it was something gray he could neither he neither could nor would want to identify because of the drawn curtains. He'd call Hope. Hope wouldn't answer the phone. He would go to the kitchen and turn the water on. He watched the silvery, twisted stream back against the sink for a while. Eventually, he'd put a cup under the stream, fill it to the brim, drink, go to the bathroom, go to the couch. Was that supposed to say couch? I don't know anymore. It's too bad to be true. All of this can't be real. Life can't crumble into pieces in an instant, just collapse inwards like a wooden block tower. Ethan couldn't remember the name of that game. Once he and Hope went to see. He and Hope. It's too bad. All of this can't be real. He didn't do anything. Could it be that he didn't do anything? No. He hit Hope. He hit her, and a red blot spread across her cheek. It was too dark to see, but Ethan knew how it goes. 
How could he do that? What happens now? What can happen now? And these thoughts were like a bunch of needles he tried to swallow over and over. Sometimes they managed to briefly forget about them. It would happen when he woke up in the gray timelessness, looked at the dirty white ceiling, and didn't remember who that Ethan Harrison was. But the pain would always come back. He had a bunch of needles in his throat, and no matter how much water he drank, he couldn't get rid of it. I his father shook him up a bit. In a sense, he could have done it, grabbing a hold of him, lifting off the ground. Mo's father was a tough man, and despite his age, he would have hit Ethan hard. Ethan was afraid of it, and at the same time, he wanted it to happen. That would have made everything easier. Maybe even fixed it all. Ethan was going over in his head as he stared at the phone screen, displaying a familiar number. He was awfully scared, yet he answered. It turned out Hope had asked her father to pack up for her. Miss Murley's voice was flat, maybe even a bit uncertain. And worst of all, he wasn't angry. This plunged Ethan into despair. He couldn't get his redemption like this. However, an upcoming visit forced Ethan to gain his senses. He shoved him back into reality, like a stream of people pushing one into a crowded subway train. He tidied up the place a bit. He shaved. He figured out what to say. Several times he rehearsed his speech in front of the mirror. And just before Mr. Murley's arrived, he then left the keys with the neighbors. Simply put, he fled. Of course, he warned Mr. Murley's beforehand with the message because he didn't have the heart to call. Ethan wanted Mr. Murleys to pick up what he had to and get out as soon as possible. Mr. Murleys wasn't going to help, that's for sure. He wasn't going to help, which meant he simply got between Ethan and his wife. Ethan was angry with Mr. Murleys, like he was the source of all the trouble. Anger was boiling up inside him, mixing with cheap coffee and turning into caustic acid. There was nothing rational about this feeling. He then had plenty of time to think about it, to weigh it, to examine it under a magnifying glass. He was sitting in a small cafe on the corner of the street until the streets got dark. He would have stayed there even longer if a waiter hadn't come to his table to tell the blah blah blah, to his table to tell the place was closing. Ethan nodded absently and asked for a moment to use the bathroom. Again, there was nothing rational about being angry with Mr. Murley's. And to be honest, it was pathetic. Just like hurting your wife and then running away not to face her father. You're scum, Ethan. Worthless scum. Ethan turned off the tap and stared at his reflection on a large mirror. A few drops of water trembled on the tip of his nose and chin. Now that was a proper punch. Waiter, sir, I'm sorry, but we, sir, are you okay? You have blood oozed from his split lip. Ethan wiped it with the back of his hand. Yes, yes, I'm fine. Sorry, I didn't mean to keep you. He smiled. The fresh wound got swollen with blood again. A red blot spread across his face, just as it should. Ethan didn't lie to the waiter, and something changed. Oh boy. The Secrets of Anatomy Example 1 Example 2 Example 3 Example 4 A ripe specimen That's definitely a tomato, alright. The screaming man is hiding here, Ductus Dusklogmaris. Interesting. That was unique. Happy Dreamland. 
Mary is a lamb. Johnny is a tree. And who's a little liar? Alia. I can't read that name backwards. It's too complicated. Well. Nothing new on the laptop. Sorry, I didn't mean to keep you. Huh. Ethan didn't lie to the waiter. He really was fine. Uh-huh. Maybe not in the same manner as before, but the gears in his head were starting to move again. When he got home, Mr. Merlis had already left. Turned out that he didn't take the keys from the neighbors. At first, Ethan assumed Mr. Merlis could cancel the visit, but as soon as he opened the door, his doubts disappeared. A strong, unfamiliar scent was filling the hallway. It could be Mr. Merlis cologne, or maybe the smell of the apartment itself. With Hope's presence faded away. Mr. Melis must have taken his daughter's keys. Somehow the possibility never crossed Ethan's mind before. He drew the air in through his nostrils and suddenly felt as sharp as clear as sharp and clear as in the dream he had days ago, something was going to happen. Ethan looked around the empty dark room and reached for the phone. Was it to perform the ritual or was he hoping something would go different this time? Short beeps. Ethan thought it was safe to say something was already happening. He only had to figure what and where. Something had changed in the picture, and it's not that Hope's favorite boss is missing from the closet. If you find the picture, you win. Or if you find the difference, you win. If you find the difference, you'll know where the gears are taking you. The hallway. Pot-bellied bowls on the dresser full of gibberish and dust. The kitchen. Hmm. Not even a row of glass jars on the shelf. An empty coffee maker bearing dry blackness at the bottom. Spoons, forks, and knives. Some of them really sharp. The bathroom. A mirror on the wall and the reflection in the closed door is open. No, not here. What about... Ethan looked his split lip. Yes, that's it. He has to check his email now. Ethan was looking carefully. Soon, like a lot of time had passed. His mailbox was full of various emails, but Ethan barely glanced at the names. He was looking for something special. And what was special about, say, letters from the agency that were gradually becoming more and more concerned. At some point, concern turned into cold and aggressive. Ethan idly scanned through the notice of contract termination. Not what he was looking for. He started with the oldest emails and scanned the list all the way to the top. Nothing. Maybe he's looking in the wrong place. Maybe there's just nothing to look for. No. Something is happening. He only has to figure what and where. Ethan got so close to the accurate answer to those questions, the light of new knowledge could have bur burned out his eyes. At the top of the list was an untitled letter. Maybe Ethan missed it the first time, or maybe it just wasn't there before. The sender was the same writer Ethan had volunteered to help, completely free of charge. Ethan's lung turned into a deflated pool ball. He clicked on the name of the letter without a name. And of course, the letter actually had a name. Mail clients carefully added untitled to the empty line, just in case you're losing it when you type your email. Because something got out of the open door in the bathroom mirror. The poor guy begged Ethan to come. The male said he couldn't sleep. He was scared, exhausted, and didn't know who else to ask. Something will get him very soon if he won't figure anything out. 
He didn't know if it was related to the work he was doing. He didn't know how to drive away, but had settled in his house. He only knew that something enormously hungry was looking at him in the darkness. You know what I mean, right? Ethan knew. By the time he finished reading the letter, Ethan already knew what he should do. Don't interfere or answer the call. Uh... Hmm... I am quite curious as to what's going on with Mr. He, but you know... Don't interfere is so obviously the wrong choice here. Yeah, which is why I want to click it. So I broke out on his Oprah lip. Ethan closed his eyes. No. Ethan said it with firm clarity. All the following words that came out of his mouth were more and more quiet until his lips moved silently. No, I'm sorry. I can't help. I'm so sorry. He really was sorry. Sorry about his former life. Sorry for himself, desperately to the point his stomach clenched with a painful spasm. Sorry for hope. Sorry for the poor writer who was being dragged deep into a cold vortex of darkness. What could he, Ethan, do against that darkness? He paled. Maybe he had the skill to get the answers required, but they were buried too deep. At that depth, the water turned pitch black, and there were things in the blackness Ethan didn't know the names of. Didn't want to know. He took a deep breath, as if he were actually about to dive. Then he deleted the email. Immortal through his work, oh boy. The letter with the title untitled disappeared into the dark vortex. The frantic, terrified pleas for help were erased, leaving no trace, as if they had never existed. No, it's not like that. Hope once told him it was a bad time for Ethan to recall this. The information on the email doesn't really disappear after you click the date. Most often, it remains somewhere on the servers, and you just lose access to it. You turn the mirror to the wall and pretend it's like it's your fantasy. There's nothing wrong with the reflection. In that case, the silent scream didn't vanish, and was now trapped. Trapped where no one could hear it. I'm so sorry. Ethan covered his face with his hands. The mirror on the wall of Ethan's dark bathroom was reflecting a closed door. Ethan and Hope got an official divorce three months later. They never talked about everything that happened. But what did actually happen? Over time, the horrors you experience get erased from memory, fade, weaken. Such are the defense mechanisms of the human psyche. Dad loves you and never stood silently at the head of your bed, clutching a pillow in his hands for some reason. When you were eight, Uncle Jeremy didn't take you to the didn't take you behind the barn, didn't show you anything or make you show anything. My grandmother's old wig does not and never has had any long spider legs. Ethan's psyche had notably suffered, but it was playing by the rules still. He wanted simple, coherent explanations, and he knew where to get them. Dr. Laura Stein was an island of clarity and sanity and the horrors, as Ethan has discovered. Fade from memory much better if you break them down into phallic symbols. Ethan wished she'd started therapy sooner. Who knows, maybe most of that nightmare could have been avoided. The police never figured out what happened, but even the clumsy version suited Ethan much better than what he remembered. What he allegedly remembered. Week after week, Ethan felt like he was gradually recovering. Of course, he had to give up his career as an independent consultant in favor of a more predictable office job, but at least he had the money for proper therapy. At some point, a small incident happened. Dr. Stein introduced an electronic registration system. As it goes with electronic registration systems, something went wrong on the second or third week. It turns out that three people had an appointment in the same time slot. Mr. Quinn's, Mr. Harrison, and Mrs. Morley's. 
The meeting felt awkward at first, but the tension faded surprisingly quickly. By mutual agreement, Mr. Quince was the first to go to Ms. Dr. Stein's office. Ethan and Hope were left alone on the couch. They were both smiling, a little tense, but overall happy. Since they meant like that, they decided to go out for coffee and talk about various things, because they hadn't spoken in a long time. Then, at some point, they decided to hold hands. The next day, they were hardly keeping their eyes open, because they only managed to sleep for a total of three hours. And that was inevitable, as in a relationship, you always have to sacrifice something. Who was that? Hope leaned over the arm of the sofa and looked at Ethan curiously. He shrugged. A literary agency, one of the few I hadn't disgraced myself in front of yet. They're looking for enough of a boring guy to be their historical consultant. The working schedule is something about a whole day, most of the night, seven days a week. So what did they say? And that I'm a happily employed office worker and I hardly enjoy cooler water. Are you serious? Ethan, don't be silly. Let him live his silly goose dreams. my turn to bring the mammoth to the cave. What about your calling? I know well enough how hard you've worked to make the startup of your survive. You'll make a homeless cat tinder if not you. <laughs> understand that Miss Merlees won't marry an ordinary office clerk, but I have a plan. Oh, come on. A sofa cushion slapped against Ethan's cheek. I tried her best to look serious, but she was too pleased to pull it off. Besides, she was burning with curiosity. What's the plan? I'm writing a book. A mythology. Something of that sort, yes. And what your future bestseller about? It seemed to hope, just for a brief moment, that Ethan's eyes became round and shiny pools of black necker, or necker, I don't know that word. The chthonic gods of ancient Greece. Open nightmare, that's nice. Oh, ending four of six. Well, look at that. We got an ending, finally. That's nice. Finish the gig, Ghost Rider. Blue Lights Hotel. Do you want to go back? Like at the other endings? No, actually. Nay car? I see. Mother of Pearl. Oh, okay, that makes sense. To the last choice. Oh, that's cool, though. That's an option, but I think I'm done. <laughs> that's not an exchange here. The light from a single source is split with a half silvered mirror. The resulting beams are each reflected by a series of mirrors. We expect them to combine at some point. 
I'm not saying it's safe. All I'm saying is dots, dots, dots. Red. Sorry. All I'm saying is we're observing the experiment. <laughs> Sorry, I became a very red boat. <laughs> oh no, not a yacht, yacht, yacht jump scare. Happy dreamland. Fear not the devil, but the god, for he walks among us and his eyes are hungry. The, the sheep is so cute there, though, like... Okay. I don't know you called it Yada's cruise ship. Same difference. We're too poor to know the difference. There are mirrors behind mirrors and doors behind doors. Some of them not like the other. And well, that was unique. Um, if it floats as a boat, so true. No, something changed here too. January eleventh. The new school is okay. I wish I could make friends with someone, though. Mama's working late again. It's fine. I've lifted a very heavy box when we moved in. Mom couldn't pick it up herself. I'm a big boy now, and big boys aren't afraid of anything. I'll just turn on the lights and watch TV with Timo and my friends. Only the cool stuff with animals or robots or aliens, but not the creepy kind. Alright, well... <laughs> that was a time. I really don't feel inclined to get the other endings, if I can be honest. This game seemed long. Honestly, eh, yes, I know. It's a, it's about well, as long as I expected it to be, to be honest. Well, thank you guys so much for joining me. I hope you guys enjoyed this game with cat question mark we never learned more about that fact which is like oh yeah this is a cat it was not a cat um i don't know man yes thank you bye bye everyone <laughs> <laughs>